Good morning, and thanks for the introduction. I'd also like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to speak at the Cornell Nutrition Conference this year. It's always such a great opportunity to share new ideas with so many great nutritionists from around the world. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Dean Boyd, who uh, was formerly at, uh, at Cornell in the Animal Science Department, uh, lately uh, with Hanor, uh, one of the large swine integrators in the US, and also Dr. Joshua Jackman of Sung Young Kwan University. The three of us recently wrote a, uh, a review that was published earlier this year on uh, medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides as antivirals and antimicrobial agents. And so a lot of this information was drawn from that and then also uh, some other research that we've done more recently. So even though I know this is largely a dairy audience, uh, we are going to present a lot of um, some swine data related to some swine viruses. Uh, but I believe what we'll see here, at least what I hope you'll see here, is that there are some applications of this technology uh, to the ruminant field, and in particular in, into calves and, and pre-ruminants. So as you're all aware, you know, we've all been uh, dealing with the veterinary feed directive for the last many years. Uh, and there's been an increase in microbial resistance, uh, shifts in consumer preferences, as well as the regulations like the VFD that have really reduced both the efficacy and uh, availability of antibiotics. So in its place, a lot of uh, people and a lot of companies are promoting natural compounds uh, to apply in livestock production to help uh, sustain animal health. And we heard a, a, a great presentation yesterday by Dr. Ballou, who touched on some of the broad classes of these natural compounds and some of the ways uh, that they can interact with the animal. And I really want to stress one thing that Dr. Ballou said yesterday was that we really need to be very diligent in understanding the fundamental chemistry of these compounds. You know, we can't just say, oh yeah, we have essential oils without really knowing what compounds are in that essential oil, what their mode of action is, and then what benefits we might expect from them. So we really need to understand those, how they inter, uh, interact with target organisms and really focus the selection of these uh, health promoters or you know, viral or pathogen mitigants uh, to reduce animal health challenges. So I'm largely gonna focus on medium chain fatty acids and medium chain monoglycerides and so I just thought a little bit of review on, on their structure and a couple of other characteristics would be warranted. So these are, this is a list of the medium chain fatty acids. So they would have uh, saturated carbon chains of six to 12 uh, carbon lengths. They have a carboxyl head group. And let me just see if I can get my pointer up here. All right. Uh, they have a carboxyl head group on all of the medium chain fatty acids. I would also point out uh, you know, that with increasing chain length, we have increasing uh, melting points such that say caproic acid would be liquid at most room temperatures. Uh, I would also, we've put in this column for the CMC or the critical micelle concentration which we'll discuss uh, here in another couple of slides, and I think is key to our understanding of the utility of these compounds in supporting animal health. And then also the smell, as that may relate to um, palatability uh, when including these in feed or water or milk or whatever way, whatever vehicle we might use to deliver it to the animal. So again, as the chain length uh, gets longer, the um, smell typically is, is reduced. Now the, the monoglycerides uh, in contrast would be the same six to 12 saturated carbon chain lengths, but instead of that carboxyl group, they have a glycerol head group up here. One of the things that that does is it helps raise the, the melting point. So these are 
all mostly solid at room temperature. Uh, the critical micelle concentration is significantly lower than the medium chain fatty acids. And the smell is minor to undetectable for all of these. Now we're gonna focus a lot of attention on the monoglyceride of lauric acid. So glycerol monolaurate, and you'll hear me referring to that as GML throughout the presentation. So a lot of this will have to, a lot of the data will show has to do with uh, GML. So we're gonna take you back to a little bit of your uh, lipid chemistry you may have had uh, in, in college. I, I can remember Dr. Andre Benzedun teaching uh, critical micelle concentration in the lipids course I took. Never thought I would use it again. But uh, amphiphilic compounds such as the fatty acids or monoglycerides will spontaneously form these micelles when they reach or above their critical micelle concentration. So we can think of it as these compounds having a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And so really the more hydrophilic the head is and the longer the chain length, making it more hydrophobic, it kind of makes conceptual sense that at lower concentrations, these would tend to form spontaneously into these micelles where the hydrophilic head is out and the hydrophobic tail is toward the inside. And one of the things that working with our, our colleague, Dr. Jackman, we've come to appreciate is that these compounds, the fatty acids or the monoglycerides will only interact with membranes of target organisms, viruses or bacteria when they are in their micellar form. So that's a, a key distinguishing factor related to their efficacy as we, uh, as we look at these and interpret these data. So here's a, a figure out of one of Dr. Jackman's recent papers where they were actually studying different mixtures of lauric acid and glycerol monolaurate or GML. And you can see that they, they formed in essence, mixed micelles of the two in, in varying proportions. And depending on those proportions, they interacted with membranes in different ways, such that the more lauric acid was in the mixture, they would tend to form the tubules, these long kind of filamentous structures. And the more GML in the mixture, they would form these more uh, spherical or bulbous uh, types of uh, buds, they're called. One thing about them is that as they form these buds or tubules, they eventually rupture and lead to disruptions, holes, uh, large gaps in the membrane. So this is a very critical function when we're looking at, uh, you know, virucidal activity or uh, antimicrobial activity is this disruption of the membrane for continued function of that, uh, that organism. So here's some data we have recently, uh, this paper's just been accepted at the, in the Journal of Animal Science and Biotechnology, in which we worked with the Armenian National Academy of Science, uh, where they have this ASF antiviral group. They've been de dealing with African swine fever for a good 10 to 12 years. So they've established quite a bit of um, expertise in this arena. Now for the dairy folks out there that may not have heard a lot about ASF, African swine fever virus is a, uh, a horrendous virus that has been percolating through Africa, the Middle East and, and occasional trips up into to Europe over the last 10 to 20 years. But more recently in August of 2018, it burst onto the scene in China and just rapidly spread through China. It has uh, near 100% mortality when pigs are infected with the ASF and it occurs very rapidly within a matter of three to four days. So a really uh, problematic virus. It's said that in the last two years, ASF probably killed about 25% of the pigs in the world. It has now spread down through Southeast Asia and made its way to Philippines and Malaysia. And we're just uh, 
you know, we're, we're, we're scared to death of the day that it hits uh, North America. But anyway, we, we, so we're looking at ASF being a lipid membraned virus uh, and looking at the activity of these various fatty acids and monoglycerides against ASF. So here's a virucidal assay, and I, I highlight virucidal because I'll show you some virucidal data, but also some antiviral data. And the difference is in the virucidal data, basically the treatments are diluted out so that they're negligible when we move to the next phase of the assay. And so we're looking really at the directly uh, disruptive effects in a very short period of time of the compounds on the virus. So after incubating the ASF virus uh, with the test compounds for one hour, and then we add it to a cell culture, and then over a number of days, the virus will infect those cells. And in the uh, virus only control, between three and four days, it will reach such a level of viral replication that it kills the cells. So that's kind of our end point. And then we can titrate the level of uh, infective virus in the, uh, in the culture. So what you can see here is that all of the fatty acids, so basically C8, C10, C12, and then glycerol monolaurate, all had a significant reduction in viral infectivity between 1.1 and 1.7 log reduction. So that's a, a, equates to about 87 to 98% reduction in infective virus uh, due to these treatments. And you can see that capric acid and, and GML were really the most effective at about a 1.7 log reduction here. And then the caprylic and lauric acids somewhat less uh, effective at um, 1.1 log reduction. Then we moved, and, and that assay was done at five millimolar concentration. And then we moved to a, a much lower concentration, so 250 micromolar. So that would be about 20 times less of the test compounds uh, than in the previous assay. We also, in this one, we did not dilute out the virus uh, when it was mixed with the treatments so that if there were any implications of the treatment on any subsequent step of viral infectivity, replication, or budding from these host cells, uh, it would be manifest in this uh, assay. So we, we incubated uh, again just for one hour uh, with the virus and the, the treatments and then added it to the Vero cells to test for this cytopathic effect. And what you can see here is that none of the medium chain fatty acids had any effect on the viral infectivity at this lower concentration of 250 micromolar. GML, however, had a significant effect and it was even greater than the virucidal activity resulting in about a 2.8 log reduction, which is like a 99.9% .9 reduction in infective virus. I would also draw your attention to the fact that uh, at 250 micromolar, we're well below the critical micelle concentration of capric and lauric acids. So below that critical micelle concentration, they're really not gonna interact with the membrane, the lipid membrane of this virus, they're not gonna have any disruptive effect. So we saw no impact on viral infectivity. But the 250 micromolar is quite a bit higher than the critical micelle concentration of GML. And so that's why we saw this significant impact, 2.8 log reduction in antiviral activity. We also, then to, to just better understand that, we, we you did a dose titration of uh, antiviral activity. And you can see that at very low concentration, 16 or 31 uh, micromolar, we saw no activity of GML, but only when we got above the critical micelle concentration did we begin to see a dose dependent reduction in viral infectivity. So again, hitting that 2.8 log reduction in viral infectivity at that 250 micromolar uh, level. 
So then working with uh, Dr. Diego Deal at the uh, Cornell Diagnostic Lab, we wanted to take this into uh, two other lipid membrane viruses which afflict the, the swine industry globally. Just in the US, uh, the PERS virus and PED viruses cause about $1.2 billion in direct losses to swine producers. So if we can come up with mitigants that help against uh, PERS and PED viruses, we could significantly improve the, the profitability of uh, swine producers as well as the health and, and survivability of, of pigs. So what you can see here is that basically the C8 monoglyceride, monocaprin, uh, had, it caused about a one log reduction in infective PERS virus, but the C10 monocaprolin, uh, lauric acid, and GML basically completely obliterated the, the PERS virus in this assay. The results in, in the PED virus, another lipid enveloped virus, uh, were a little more variable. The medium chain monoglycerides, monocaprin and monocaprolin, led to about a, a 2 and 1.5 log reduction in viral infectivity. The lauric acid by itself uh, led to about a 3 log reduction. And again, GML just uh, completely wiped out any infective PED virus. So highly effective against these, uh, all of these lipid membraned viruses. So as I said earlier, these same concepts apply to uh, bacterial pathogens, which have a uh, basically a phospholipid membrane. So uh, again, Dr. Jackman and, and some of his uh, co-workers in Korea looked at lauric acid, SDS, sodi sodium dodecyl sulfate, always mess up on that, uh, and also glycerol monolaurate and their minimum inhibitory concentration against a, a common pathogen, Staph aureus. And this was a multi-drug resistant uh, Staph aureus strain. And so basically you can see that the minimum inhibitory concentration of each of these compounds was only effective above the critical micelle concentration. So lauric acid with a 900 micromolar concentration, the minimum inhibitory concentration was about a thousand. And similarly with SDS and with GML, they, they were effective, but only above, only to a level above their critical micelle concentration. So how might these, uh, in, in bacteria in particular, how might these agents uh, interact with these cells to call, cause these effects? So uh, Dr. Jackman has identified four major disruptions in, in bacteria. And they, the first would be that they mess up uh, basically by destabilizing this lipid membrane. They destabilize uh, the electron transport and energy metabolism. But they also uh, can mess up uh, membrane bound enzymes or membrane bound uh, receptors. So basically, as that uh, membrane is disrupted, it can shift the conformation of these various proteins and thereby reduce their activity. So they can, you know, these could be just bacteria static effects, meaning, you know, it's, they haven't really killed the bacteria, but they've reduced its ability to uh, replicate and metabolize. Or it could be completely bactericidal in that it, uh, you know, completely disrupts the viral, uh, excuse me, the bacterial membrane, causing lysis of the cell and cell death. And the, the cool thing about these compounds and their potential use as mitigants, mitigants is that they are highly unlikely to develop resistance to these compounds because they're very, in a sense, generic and general disruptions of the membrane rather than a very specific receptor or enzyme that many antibiotics would target. So they're not likely able to develop any mutation which would uh, overcome 
this really it's a, a strictly chemical disruption of that membrane. So uh, the, the likelihood of developing resistance is, is very, very low. But one thing that uh, Dr. Jackman's lab has, has pointed out in numerous publications is that the, the phospholipid membranes of the pathogens can differ quite a bit. For instance, gram-positive bacteria have very simple single layer membranes, whereas gram-negative bacteria have more complex inner and outer membrane structures. And then among the viruses, it's very similar. Uh, PED has a very simple single, single layer envelope. And ASF, uh, there was a Balchem webinar earlier this week and uh, the, uh, the presenter there described the ASF virus as a tank among the viruses. And so very, very difficult to disrupt and, and uh, treat. So we, we need to think about the different compositions of these membranes and then we can better target the medium chain fatty acid or monoglycerides, which would be effective against that particular membrane. The, the cool thing about these uh, compounds is they also have a number of other uh, benefits. And when I first started looking into them three and a half, four years ago, uh, most of the literature I could find related to human AIDS uh, work. And so one of the ways that uh, GML in particular could prevent the transmission of the AIDS virus was that it reduced inflammation at the site of infection. And then you didn't get recruitment of macrophages to the site of infection. The macrophages in turn get infected and then spread the, spread the infection uh, systemically. So that, that anti-inflammatory activity was a key part. So we wanted to test some of the different forms of lauric acid, both GML, uh, the methyl ester of lauric acid, and then lauric acid itself in a uh, anti-inflammatory assay that was developed in uh, Barry Bradford's lab. And so you can see a very nice dose dependent reduction in LPS stimulated inflammation with increasing levels of any of these different forms of lauric acid. So that could be a key activity that really contributes to the efficacy of uh, products containing lauric acid or GML. Another cool attribute of this is that, you know, these compounds in addition to the, this other bioactivity, they're also very positive uh, for growth promotion. And we reviewed this extensively in that uh, review we published earlier this year. But to kind of summarize it, basically use of the medium chain fatty acids or monoglycerides and combinations of them will in general improve nutrient digestibility. They tend to shift the intestinal microbiome away from pathogenic species and toward more uh, beneficial gut microbes. There'll be a reduction in gut inflammation and thereby uh, typically also gut permeability. So that will be reduced. And then improvements in the structure of uh, the intestinal epithelium and then at the end of the day, these are usually manifested as improvements in average daily gain and feed conversion. Uh, and, and quite often when they were compared to an antibiotic treatment, uh, they performed similarly in terms of these uh, productive parameters. So they've also been promoted uh, quite widely as feed mitigants because uh, pathogens such as salmonella, PED virus, and ASF uh, have been shown to remain viable and infectious and in feed for extended periods of time. Uh, they've been promoted and, and researched over the last few years as uh, alternatives to some of the current mitigants, things like formaldehyde, which we really shouldn't want in our, in our feed uh, supply chain, much less our food supply chain. So this is some, some work we did uh, with Dr. Lauren Wernick uh, there at the vet school at Cornell. And basically we showed a, a very nice dose dependent reduction in uh, an antibiotic uh, resistant salmonella. 
uh, with increasing levels of GML blended into feed. Then we, we also, with our uh, collaborators in Armenia, we, we took this uh, study to uh, look at ASF and mitigating the risk of African swine fever virus in feed. So what we basically did was blended uh, either a, a combination of medium chain fatty acids or GML into pig feed. We spiked it with the virus and then we incubated that for either 30 minutes or 24 hours. Uh, at the end of that period, we added the little media, we centrifuged it to get all the feed particles out, but leave the virus particles in suspension. And then we took samples of that and we looked at it three different ways. One was a virus infectivity assay, just like we've done earlier. We also did uh, quantitative PCR for DNA. And then we also did an ELISA assay looking for the major structural protein of the, the virus shell. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. So in terms of infectious ASF virus uh, recovered from the feed, we saw no benefits of the medium chain, this blend of medium chain fatty acids at any of the levels we tested. And then only when we got to 1% GML in the feed did we see this, it wasn't significant. There was a, a tendency for a reduction that amounted to about 67% reduction in infectious virus. And then with 2% GML, uh, we saw almost a one log reduction, about 0.94 log reduction in infectious uh, ASF. Now, I will say that there are a lot of other reports of mitigants being used uh, in feed. Typically, they use a 10 to the fifth uh, TCID 50s, which is the dose of virus added to the, the feed sample. We actually use 10 times more, so 10 to the sixth TCID 50s uh, of the virus in, in these assays because we wanted to be sure we could recover the virus from the feed and it wouldn't get below the level of detection. But um, our subsequent assays, we're going to be running at the, what's been become more the norm, uh, 10 to the fifth uh, of the virus particle. Similarly, at, at 24 hours, so this is the, the graph on the left is just after 30 minutes, so very quick acting. Uh, this on the right is after 24 hours. And you'll note that there was you know, about a 0.7 log reduction in the infective virus just due to it sitting there in the feed for 24 hours. So there's some natural degradation of the virus there. In terms of the amount of DNA, we really haven't done anything through this treatment to alter or degrade the viral DNA. So none of the treatments had any effect on the viral DNA at either 30 minutes or 24 hours. And if, if you're not familiar with the um, readout from a quantitative PCR, this CT value or cycle threshold value is really an inverse scale. So the lower the level, that re the lower the readout, the more DNA is present. So you know this basically says after 24 hours, there was less DNA present, but none of it was affected by the um, treatments. So now we'll look at the, the assay on the um, P72 capsid protein, which makes up about 92% of the capsid of this ASF virus. So there's an outer uh, lipid envelope, there's the protein capsid, and then there's an inner lipid envelope. So uh, when we measure uh, the P72 protein, we're looking for conformationally intact. So it has to be in its, in its uh, native shape and, and form for the antibody to detect it. And what we saw here was, was really interesting. And we believe this is the first report of this kind of disruption of the ASF virus is that in a very dose dependent manner, the more GML was in the feed, the more we saw disruption of this P72 protein. So that's gonna have implications for the virus's ability 
to attach and infect host cells. So again, I, I've probably bored you to tears uh, talking, showing you all this data related to swine, but I, I really think that there are applica applications for both antimicrobial and antiviral activity in uh, calves in particular. Many of the calf hood viruses are lipid enveloped like PED, PERS, or ASF. Uh, things like coronavirus, BRSV, PI3, um, all of those are lipid enveloped and could be uh, susceptible to mitigation with compounds like this. So I think there's, uh, you know, these calf hood diseases as well as applications in mastitis, uterine uh, infections, or topical infections. And you know, I think that one of the best ways we could deliver it is in either drinking water or milk. Uh, so, you know, being able to suspend these in uh, either of those media would uh, would be a big advance because often when animals are sick, you, you probably all know they'll they'll still drink where they may go off feed. So, if we can get these compounds into the animals, reduce the inflammation, reduce the pathogen load we're gonna really improve their uh, likelihood of a good outcome. So most sources of these medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides are grass and readily implemented uh, in diets for livestock. They're very potent antimicrobials and antivirals with the additional benefits of having anti-inflammatory and also growth promoting activity. But we really do, as Dr. Ballou said, we really do need to take the time to target the solutions to the specific health challenge so that we uh, can better assure positive out outcomes. And I think uh, Mike said it best yesterday that structure determines function and we've got to know what structures we're working with to have the best outcome. Thank you, Kristen. I look forward to any questions. Great, thank you, Charlie. That was um, um, incredibly right on time. So we've got uh, five minutes for questions. Um, there were a couple of questions about this non-specificity of um, using these these fatty acids as antimicrobials, and if what impact they would have on the um, intestinal lining or um, gut microflora. I think you touched on this, but if you could expand on it, that would be that would be great. Yeah, um, because you know many mammalian cells also have phos phospholipid membranes, so there is potential to to disrupt them. Uh, one of the first steps we took when we started uh, this collaboration was to look at the cytotoxicity of these compounds, and we tested a lot of different concentrations, and some of them were uh, well. Got ahead of myself. Um, none of these had any cytotoxic effects on uh, the various cells that we tested. So at the concentrations we're using, you know, five millimolar, 250 micromolar, which equate to, you know, very low PPM in the, in the solution, if you want to put it in that kind of terms. Um, we, we've done some other work with flavonoids, screening different flavonoids in this antiviral assay, and we did find that many of those uh, largely phenolic compounds were highly cytotoxic. So their applicability to this kind of uh, use would, would, I think, be compromised. Okay, thank you. Um, the, there's also quite a few questions about delivery method. And I know you answered that in one of your last slides with a, a couple of recommendations. Um, so if you could expand on what you, what you perceive as the recommended delivery method and also dose. Um, and in particular, there's a question about if it is um, applied to the feed in a dry form, is it effective? And then would, would that, um, uh, would the application to the feed beforehand, would that functionality in, in antimicrobial um, activity carry through to the animal? That's, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So yes, we're looking at feed applications and, but nobody really has answered yet. And I, I had a conversation this morning with Dr. Deal at the diagnostic lab about that hydration step. Any of these assays we do 
you know, to get them into the assay, uh, you know, we'll spike the feed sample with the mitigant in there. Um, but at some step, we have to hydrate it. And, and does the activity occur only then once it's hydrated? We, the same might be said for, you know, once the feed gets hydrated in the animal's mouth, in saliva, and then in the, in the stomach. Um, Dr. Jackman's work has shown that these disruptions uh, to viral membranes occur on the order of seconds. It's just, it's very, very rapid. So um, while we might, you know, hope or think that there's applicate that it's actually having the activity in dry feed maybe there's enough water activity there to to uh, allow some of that interaction and, and mitigation to occur but it, it very likely it's happening once that feed gets hydrated okay thank you and then we'll have one more question about um dose um so there's a, couple, a bunch of questions about dose and, and what if the required dose would be cost effective, but um, also would the um, dose does the dose need to be so high that it would um, influence the um, metabolism of the animal and perhaps any have any influence on insulin sensitivity or resistance? Um, so, in essence, I mean we're looking at um, and, and we've done some in vivo studies where, you know, a, a kilo to two kilos of GML has uh, warded off a, a PERS virus challenge in pigs, for instance. So that's, you know, that's a, a pretty low feeding rate and, and would not be at all cost prohibitive. Um, and, and most of the, these would be within ranges of many of the uh, growth promoting studies uh, where they've looked at these compounds, whether it's the, the fatty acids or monoglycerides and actually have beneficial effects for, uh, you know, average daily gain, feed conversion, gut health, all of those kinds of things. So um, we, we see them as, as very viable, uh, both you know, it's a, it's a really cool uh, research topic, but it's also highly practical uh, to implement. 